desolation of the earth. Her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. In the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously, so much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her shall bewail her and lament for her, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. Revelation 18, verses 5 to 10. The merchants of the earth that have waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing and saying, Alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour so great riches is come to naught. Revelation 18, verses 11 and 3, also verses 15 to 17. Such are the judgments that fall upon Babylon in the day of the visitation of God's wrath. She has filled up the measure of her iniquity. Her time has come. She is ripe for destruction. When the voice of God turns the captivity of His people, there is a terrible awakening of those who have lost all in the great conflict of life. While probation continued, they were blinded by Satan's deceptions, and they justified their course of sin. The rich prided themselves upon their superiority to those who were less favored. But they had obtained their riches by violation of the law of God. They had neglected to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to deal justly, and to love mercy. They had sought to exalt themselves and to obtain the homage of their fellow creatures. Now they are stripped of all that made them great and are left destitute and defenseless. They look with terror upon the destruction of the idols which they preferred before their Maker. They have sold their souls for earthly riches and enjoyments, and have not sought to become rich toward God. The result is, their lives are a failure, their pleasures are now turned to gall, their treasures to corruption. The gain of a lifetime is swept away in a moment. The rich bemoan the destruction of their grand houses, the scattering of their gold and silver but their lamentations are silenced by the fear that they themselves are to perish with their idols. The wicked are filled with regret, not because of their sinful neglect of God and their fellow men, but because God has conquered. They lament that the result is what it is, but they do not repent of their wickedness. They would leave no means untried to conquer if they could. The world see the very class whom they have mocked and derided and desired to exterminate, pass unharmed through pestilence, tempest, and earthquake. He who is to the transgressors of his law a devouring fire is to his people a safe pavilion. The minister who has sacrificed truth to gain the favor of men now discerns the character and influence of his teachings. It is apparent that the omniscient eye was following him as he stood in the desk, as he walked the streets, as he mingled with men in the various scenes of life. Every emotion of the soul, every line written, every word uttered, every act that led men to rest in a refuge of falsehood has been scattering seed, and now in the wretched lost souls around him he beholds the harvest. Saith the Lord, they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. With lies ye have made the heart of the righteous sad, whom I have not made sad, and strengthened the hands of the wicked, that he should not return from his wicked way by promising him life. Jeremiah 8, 11, and Ezekiel 13, 22. Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings. Howl, ye shepherds, and cry, and wallow yourselves in the ashes, ye principal of the flock. For your days for slaughter and of your dispersions are accomplished. And the shepherd shall have no way to flee, nor the principal of the flock to escape. Jeremiah 23, 1 and 2, 
and chapter 25, verses 34 and 35, the marginal reading. Ministers and people see that they have not sustained the right relation to God. They see that they have rebelled against the author of all just and righteous law. The setting aside of the divine precepts gave rise to thousands of springs of evil, discord, hatred, iniquity, until the earth became one vast field of strife, one sink of corruption. This is the view that now appears to those who rejected truth and chose to cherish error. No language can express the longing which the disobedient and disloyal feel for that which they have lost forever, eternal life. Men whom the world has worshipped for their talents and eloquence now see these things in their true light. They realize what they have forfeited by transgression, and they fall at the feet of those whose fidelity they have despised and derided, and confess that God has loved them. The people see that they have been deluded. They accuse one another of having led them to destruction, but all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon the ministers. Unfaithful pastors have prophesied smooth things. They have led their hearers to make void the law of God and to persecute those who would keep it holy. Now, in their despair, these teachers confess before the world their work of deception. The multitudes are filled with fury. We are lost, they cry, and you are the cause of our ruin. And they turn upon the false shepherds. The very ones that once admired them most will pronounce the most dreadful curses upon them. The very hands that once crowned them with laurels will be raised for their destruction. The swords which were to slay God's people are now employed to destroy their enemies. Everywhere there is strife and bloodshed. A noise shall come even to the ends of the earth, for the Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will plead with all flesh. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. Jeremiah 25:31. For six thousand years the great controversy has been in progress. The Son of God and His heavenly messengers have been in conflict with the power of the evil one to warn, enlighten, and save the children of men. Now all have made their decisions. The wicked have fully united with Satan in his warfare against God. The time has come for God to vindicate the authority of His downtrodden law. Now the controversy is not alone with Satan, but with men. The Lord hath a controversy with the nations. He will give them that are wicked to the sword. The mark of deliverance has been set upon those that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done. Now the angel of death goes forth, represented in Ezekiel's vision by the men with the slaughtering weapons, to whom the command is given, Slay! utterly old and young, both maids and little children and women, but come not near any man upon whom is the mark, and begin at my sanctuary. Says the prophet, they began at the ancient men which were before the house. Ezekiel 9, the first six verses. The work of destruction begins among those who have professed to be the spiritual guardians of the people. The false watchmen are the first to fall. There are none to pity or to spare. Men, women, maidens, and little children perish together. The Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. Isaiah 26, 21. And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet and their eyes shall consume away in their holes, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. Zechariah chapter 14, verses 12 and 13. In the mad strife of their own fierce passions, and by the awful outpouring of God's unmingled wrath, fall the wicked inhabitants of the earth, priests, rulers, and people, rich and poor, high and low. And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. Jeremiah 25, 33. At the coming of Christ the wicked are blotted from the face of the whole earth, consumed with the spirit of his mouth and destroyed by the brightness of his glory. Christ takes his people to the city of God, and the earth is emptied of its inhabitants. 
Behold, the Lord maketh the earth empty, and maketh it waste, and turneth it upside down, and scattereth abroad the inhabitants thereof. The land shall be utterly emptied, and utterly spoiled. For the Lord hath spoken this word. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, broken the everlasting covenant, therefore hath the curse devoured the earth, and they that dwell therein are desolate. Therefore the inhabitants of the earth are burned. Isaiah chapter 24, verses 1, 3, 5, and 6. The whole earth appears like a desolate wilderness, the ruins of cities and villages destroyed by the earthquake, uprooted trees, ragged rocks thrown out by the sea or torn out of the earth itself, are scattered over its surface, while vast caverns mark the spot where the mountains have been rent from their foundations. Now the event takes place foreshadowed in the last solemn service of the Day of Atonement. When the ministration in the Holy of Holies had been completed, and the sins of Israel had been removed from the sanctuary by virtue of the blood of the sin offering, then the scapegoat was presented alive before the Lord, and in the presence of the congregation the high priest confessed over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Leviticus 16, verse 21. In like manner, when the work of atonement in the heavenly sanctuary has been completed, then in the presence of God and heavenly angels and the host of the redeemed, the sins of God's people will be placed upon Satan. He will be declared guilty of all the evil which he has caused them to commit. And as the scapegoat was sent away into a land not inhabited, so Satan will be banished to the desolate earth an uninhabited and dreary wilderness. The revelator foretells the banishment of Satan and the condition of the chaos and desolation to which the earth is to be reduced, and he declares that this condition will exist for a thousand years. After presenting the scenes of the Lord's second coming and the destruction of the wicked, the prophecy continues, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years should be fulfilled. And after that he must be loosed a little season. Revelation 20, verses 1 to 3. That the expression, bottomless pit, represents the earth in a state of confusion and darkness is evident from other scriptures. Concerning the condition of the earth in the beginning, the Bible record says that it was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Genesis 1, 2. Prophecy teaches that it will be brought back, partially at least, to this condition. Looking forward to the great day of God, the prophet Jeremiah declares, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens were fled. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness, and all the cities thereof were broken down. Jeremiah 4, verses 23 to 26. Here is to be the home of Satan with his evil angels for a thousand years. Limited to the earth, he will not have access to other worlds to tempt and annoy those who have never fallen. It is in this sense that he is bound. There are none remaining upon whom he can exercise his power. He is wholly cut off from the work of deception and ruin which for so many centuries has been his sole delight. The prophet Isaiah, looking forward to the time of Satan's overthrow, exclaims, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners? Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 to 17. 
For six thousand years Satan's work of rebellion has made the earth to tremble. He has made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof. And he opened not the house of his prisoners. For six thousand years his prison house has received God's people, and he would have held them captive forever. But Christ has broken his bonds and set the prisoners free. Even the wicked are now placed beyond the power of Satan, and alone with his evil angels he remains to realize the effect of the curse which sin has brought. The kings of the nations, even all of them, lie in glory, every one in his own house, the grave. But thou art cast out of thy grave like an abominable branch. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. Isaiah 14, verses 18 to 20. For a thousand years Satan will wander to and fro in the desolate earth to behold the results of his rebellion against the law of God. During this time his sufferings are intense. Since his fall, his life of unceasing activity has banished reflection. But he is now deprived of his power and left to contemplate the part which he has acted since first he rebelled against the government of heaven, and to look forward with trembling and terror to the dreadful future when he must suffer for all the evil that he has done and be punished for the sins that he has caused to be committed. To God's people the captivity of Satan will bring gladness and rejoicing. Says the prophet, It shall come to pass in the day that Jehovah shall give thee rest from thy sorrow and from thy trouble and from the hard service wherein thou wast made to serve, that thou shalt take up this parable against the king of Babylon, here representing Satan, and say, how hath the oppressor ceased? Jehovah hath broken the staff of the wicked, the scepter of the rulers, that smote the peoples in wrath with a continual stroke, that ruled the nations in anger with a persecution that none restrained. Verses 3 to 6 in the Revised Version. During the thousand years between the first and second resurrection, the judgment of the wicked takes place. The Apostle Paul points to this judgment as an event that follows a second advent. Judge nothing before the time, until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Daniel declares that when the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given to the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7, 22. At this time the righteous reign as kings and priests unto God. John in the Revelation says, I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. They shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. Revelation 20, verses 4 and 6. It is at this time that, as foretold by Paul, the saints shall judge the world. 1 Corinthians 6, 2. In union with Christ they judge the wicked, comparing their acts with the statute book, the Bible and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Then the portion which the wicked must suffer is meted out, according to their works, and it is recorded against their names in the book of death. Satan also, and evil angels, are judged by Christ and his people. Says Paul, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Verse 3. And Jude declares that the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. Jude 6. At the close of the thousand years, the second resurrection will take place. Then the wicked will be raised from the dead, and appear before God for the execution of the judgment written. Thus the revelator, after describing the resurrection of the righteous, says, The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. Revelation 20. 5. And Isaiah declares, concerning the wicked, They shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit, and shall be shut up in the prison, and after many days shall they be visited. Isaiah 24, 22. Chapter 41. Desolation of the Earth.